Good morning, members, officers, and any members of the public who are viewing the live stream of this meeting. Welcome to this meeting of the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee. My name is Councillor Tony Mason, and I am the chair of the committee. Please can those present in the council chamber note that everything on your desk, including your laptop screen, is likely to be broadcast at some point. The camera follows the microphone being switched on, so councillors and officers are advised to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up. Please, please can those participating in the meeting via the live stream indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column. Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose. Make sure that your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you are invited to do otherwise. Please ensure that you have switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they may do not interrupt the proceedings. Please use a headset when speaking and hold the microphone close to your mouth. When you are invited to address this meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you finish addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately, speak slowly and clearly, and please do not talk over or interrupt anyone. <coughs> apologies. Chair, uh, item one on our agenda is apologies for absence. Patrick, are there any apologies for absence? Uh, yes, Chair, we have apologies from Councillor Joe Sales. Uh, no substitutes. <clears throat> Declarations of interest. Do any members have interests to declare in relation to any item of business on this agenda? If an interest subsequently becomes apparent later in the meeting, could you please raise uh, this at that, at that point? No declarations of interest. Okay. Minutes. <clears throat> Are members happy to approve the minutes of meeting of the committee held on the 20th of September 2021 as a correct record? Um, it was just, I agree, it's a, a reflection of the um, meeting chair. There's just um, a couple of things within the report, um, or within the minutes, sorry, that would just be great to have followed up, for example, the organisational chart and things like that, which I appreciate it's been, been a lot on, but if we could still make sure that we receive that information um, and the recruitment of the um, 0.5 full-time equivalent, if we can make sure that's happened. Thank you, Chair. Would you like to respond to that, Peter? So, are we there? Yeah, there. Um, in response to the second question, yes, I can confirm that we've recruited the 0.5 FTE. Uh, and in, in regard to the first point, I'll get a structured chart issued and pass around as soon as I possibly can. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Peter. If, if there are no further queries on the minutes, um, I move to, to the approval of the, meet, of the minutes. Um, if the committee agrees, we can approve the meeting minutes by affirmation. Okay, agreed. Next item on the agenda is, is public questions. Uh, we have received two public questions, one from Rosalind Barden and one from Daniel Fulton. Rosalind Barden, please, can you ask your question? Yes, good morning, everyone. Thanks for inviting me to ask this question. Uh, just by very brief background, I actually worked in IT for a number of years and I led big change programs, including implementing ERP systems. And that was always in the commercial world. And we always managed to achieve that without any interruption to the quarterly reporting cycles, because we had plans, implementation that followed strict rules. We had thorough testing, we knew what we were doing. But I keep seeing issues with your fixed asset register causing order issues at the council. So that leads me into my question, which is, I know that the delays in finalising South Cam's District Council's 2018-19 accounts are being blamed in part on issues around the implementation of the fixed asset register. I'm struggling to understand how the council got itself into the position of what looks to be issues with data migration over three years after the new register was implemented. And I would therefore like to ask the committee if there has been any investigation into what went wrong, and if so, what changes to procedure have been put in place to avoid similar issues arising? 
If not, will the committee recommend that such an investigation and a lessons learned exercise be carried out so that the council can avoid further implementation problems? Okay, thank you. Yeah, the, um, the asset register was originally implemented over three years ago and the issues with the data migration were identified by the capital accountant currently managing this when they took this on in the autumn of 2019. A lot of work has been undertaken to correct this data and update the register, but it is fair to say that it is taking longer than expected. We believe the register now contains the correct data, but can find no evidence of a project plan and proper testing being carried out when the data was originally migrated in early 2018. Quite clearly, this is unsatisfactory and the council need to understand what went wrong and why. Once both the council and the audit team are happy that the register is accurate, we can carry out that necessary review. We have also asked for a review to be carried out of the system by our internal audit team so they can satisfy themselves that all the correct controls and processes are in place going forward. I mean, as, as an aside, this audit committee did request that internal audit got involved in the fixed asset register review and the internal audit te um, team will be conducting a review of the fi fixed asset register. Do you have a supplementary question? Yes, thank you for that. Um, yes, thanks for that. That's good to know. Um, I did actually, since submitting my question, had a chance to read the risk register, which is in the pack for this meeting. And I can find some IT risks, but they are all to do with business continuity, um, total systems failure, security breaches and so on. What I can't see in there and perhaps might want to be considered, given the experience on this project, is are there risks concerned with other implementations that the council's carried out in the last while that could yet come and uh, bite? Or are there issues in the way that the council carries out implementations in general that need to be addressed so that we don't get a repeat of this kind of implementation issues? So I think in the risk, re sorry, in the risk register, there should be a risk around software implementation. That's my supplementary. Given the, the technical nature of that question, uh, I'd request that we, we provide a written response to that question uh, and review with our, with our IT department. I'll provide that response to, to the committee post post this meeting. Is that, is that okay? Well, yes, that's the that's way of doing it. That was it. Thank you. Chairman, may I ask if we can have a written answer that, that, no, that I, written. I, I did. And, and to everybody involved, please. Thank you. Yeah, no, I, I, we will get a, a written response to the question and, and be provided to the committee and, and, and ensure it's provided to, to the people who responded. Yeah. Okay, thank you for your question. Um, Daniel Fulton, can, please can you ask your question? Uh, yes, Chair, thank you. Um, does the Chair of the Committee feel that the governance arrangements for the Council's uh, shared services um, um, are currently fit for purpose? So, in, uh, yes, I am satisfied with the current governance arrangements of the shared services and that they are appropriate for each of the services with member oversight from each Council. <clears throat> These arrangements have been in place for a number of years and are subject to review currently ensure that they are fit for purpose moving forward as our services and relationships continue to develop. To develop. Do you have a supplementary question? Uh, yes, I do. Um, thank you for your response, by the way. Um, the Council's information and communication and technology functions are the responsibility of 3C Shared Services ICT. And as today's meeting papers note, the council considers there to be a significant risk of major IT failure resulting in a complete loss of service and network connectivity. Assurance in regards to this issue is supposed to be provided by quarterly performance, finance and risk reviews undertaken by the shared service director board with each head of service. Amid other concerns about performance at 3C Shared Services ICT recently, I attempted to contact the head of service. I was somewhat alarmed to discover that the head of service's email address at 3C was no longer operational. 
and attempts to contact the head of service through two active departmental emails uh, were not successful. Somewhat concerned about the lack of response, I tried to find an organizational chart for 3C Shared Services, ICT, uh, which required sorting through two and a half years of meeting papers at eight different committees of three different councils before I could actually find the organizational chart. Once I did, I noticed that the head of services at 3C ICT, which serves Huntington Shared District Council, South Cambridgeshire District Council, and Cambridge City Council, apparently a full-time role, the same individual is also apparently occupies a separate full-time position as assistant director for IT at Cambridgeshire County Council and Peterborough City Council. Perhaps the head of service simply doesn't have the time to address the risk of major IT infrastructure failures given her dual full-time roles on two different services serving a total of five councils. Will the chair of the Corporate Governance Committee agree to discuss the governance arrangements of 3C ICT with the chair of the Scrutiny Committee and agree for one committee or the other to add the governance arrangements at 3C ICT to the agenda for a future meeting? It's a very long question and, and I will have to give a written response and discuss with the chair of scrutiny as to where this lies. My position would be that the Audit and Corporate Governance Committee are an overview for the frameworks of, of the council uh, and scrutiny are involved in the operations of the council and ensuring that they are sufficient. So we need to understand where the gap lies and, and where the, the meeting of, of your question is as to where it fits in audit or in scrutiny. So I, I will contact the, the chair of the scrutiny committee and provide a, a written response, but also on, a, on your very detailed information on 3C ICT, we'll also seek to get a head of service involved as well. Great, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, uh, that, that concludes the questions. Uh, we move to agenda item five, uh, audit appointment for 23-24 onwards, uh, the appointing of the auditors. May I ask Peter Maddock to introduce this item? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so this item is about uh, appointing an auditor for the period starting in 2023-24. The process goes in a five-year cycle uh, and the current uh, appointment cycle ends at the end of 2022-2023. Um, we have to inform the PSAA which route we need to take or we want to take by 31st of March. Uh, so this report is just outlining the merits of one route or the other. Just to say the recommendation is around following the auditor appointment route with the public sector auditing appointments. 98% um, of local authorities go by that route. Um, whichever route we take, we will be... Um, the appointed auditors will be the same. There's, a, there's about six firms that can do local authority audits. So um, the recommendation is to follow the PSAA route on the basis that um, to follow the other route would involve a procurement process, quite a bit of work, probably additional expense, and I don't believe there will be any benefit to be gained by doing that. Um, so just for members to, uh, to comment, possibly. Um, but the recommendation is that we join the PSAA route. Um, so, are there any questions or comments? Councillor Williams, then Councillor Howell. Okay, I'm going to try and talk and not get too much feedback. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, I, you know, the PSAA contract is something that we have discussed at previous meetings, and indeed, I recall a meeting um, that my, I, I attended, that the Chair and I believe some former members now of the committee, given the, the length of time it was, with a representative in relation to these contracts, because obviously we weren't, weren't satisfied at the time of the provision that was being given to us by our external auditors. However, I think 
realistically, it is the most sensible and pragmatic. It's not, not the perfect route, but I think it is the most pragmatic route that we have available to us, given the um, very small number of firms that actually cover this field. And what I would like to ask, because I'll say we've obviously not been entirely happy with this, is the risk the risk to us if we weren't on our own able to find and secure an external auditor, what risks that would expose us to, because that's what's making me think sometimes it's, um, you know, the better of two evils. Uh, the, the risk if we, if we were to do our own contact is that um, we might not actually get anybody to, um, who wants to do the contact via that route, so we could potentially find the run the exercise. The, the contract that the PSAA run is with the auditors rather than the authority uh, and that's a standard contact so you know the level of service, you know what you're going to get, you clearly know what you're going to get from that contract um, and the difficulty will be if we do it ourselves is scoping out that contract so that we adequately cover anything and that would be quite a lot of work. So those would be the two risks I would see that expose ourselves to if we went alone, really. Councillor Hannah. Thank you. I appreciate I might be coming in here late in the day, but um, have we looked at the ESPO audit framework and thought about using that? After all, it is a local authority-owned company. Uh, I haven't. Um, and Chairman, may I just request that um, when you have the opportunity to look at ESPO, E-S-P-O, ESPO, and if you put into computer, ESPO audit framework, and I believe it's lot 2C is the external audit framework. ESPO is a company that's owned, part owned by Cambridgeshire County Council, as well as several other councils, and they provide frameworks, as well as textbooks and things which we all ask you. So just have a look, that's all I'm asking. But I appreciate I'm coming in late in the day. Thank you. And Councillor Williams and myself are county councillors. We should declare. <laughs> Councillor John Williams was a county councillor. <laughs> Thanks, Chair. Um, so just a question on the uh, PSAA contract. Um, if we go through that route, um, is, can I ask, are, are the auditors engaged on a, um, a sort of standardised contract that are, that are shared, that's shared with all councils that work through PSAA, or are we able to um, add supplementary clauses to that contract? So the contract itself is, is standard because every audit has certain things that are the same in them. However, some authorities will have additional requirements. So, for example, um, we have uh, a wholly owned subsidiary. So there's some additional work that the auditors would need to do um, that they wouldn't need to do for other authorities. So there is scope for there to be some variation, but obviously that's, you know, that needs to be quite tightly managed. Uh, thank you, Chair. If I may ask a, a, a brief supplementary question. So the, the reason why I ask this is that we, um, we had, um, at, at a couple of points, conversations with EY about the impact of um, the, 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 the resourcing at particular points throughout the audit process and the financial impact that delays have caused on the Council. Um, and I just wonder, when we've had those conversations, the the response has very much been that the costs to the council are uh, relate to work done as opposed to any additional costs in, that are indirectly incurred by the council as a result of their lack of um, resourcing at any given point. I wonder whether we might be able to include within the contract some provision that acknowledges that should the future auditors find themselves in a position where they have a uh, lack of resource, which in, indirectly in, uh, incurs costs to the council, then there is some recognition of that within the balance. Yes, that sounds, that sounds highly sensible, so yes, I'll, I'll pick that point up. Thank you. Councillor 
any, any further questions from, from the committee? So the recommendation is, is that this committee agree that the, the appointing of the auditor for the next accounting period in the PSA a contract and framework is used for this <coughs> process from 1st of April 2023 as laid down yeah, paragraph 4. Sorry, Chair. Um, it's just on the comments made by Councillor Howe, perhaps in the recommendation we can have that subject to looking into this alternative, as we know that hasn't been explored yet. As we've got to, we've got to March, is that correct? Um, yes, yeah, so we, we have to submit an expression of interest, I think, early in the new year. So, yeah, I'd need to look at that sort of pretty urgently, but yeah, that should give us enough time. So, Chairman, if, if we could sort of delegate the investigation of, of this alternative to Mr. Maddox as Section 151 officer, um, so that he has time to act if he needs to. But um, I think given given the situation we found ourselves, an alternative looking into it would be would be diligent. I, 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 I agree. Councillor John Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just a point of information, uh, unless the County Council um, obviously is going through the same process as us, um, but um, at the moment and in the past, it has used PSAA. Um, so, um, yes, it does have, it has set up an independent company, but as far as I'm aware, when I was on the Audit and Accounts Committee of the County Council, we used the PSAA appointed external auditor. Noted, but with, with the Chairman, with your permission, I, I'm quite happy for it to delegate to yourself and, and others for the final decision. But I mean, you know, we can give a, a, a yes now. But um, all I'm asking is just how, consider P, uh, ESPO, that's all. If it's not suitable for whatever reason, then that, uh, that, that comes down to yourselves. I, I think I, I, I take on board the, the comments, and, and, and as outlined, the change the recommendation that it is a recommendation pending a suitable review and and then feedback to myself as chair with the section 151 officer and I, i'm more than happy with that chairman I, I i will provide then a, a written response to the committee if that's your proposed recommendation chair then i'm happy with that and happy to second it so okay So pending that, is, is the committee in agreement? Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> go to agenda other item six, the final accounts update. Um, may I ask Peter Maddox to present this item? Thank you. So, um, this is the report that looks at the uh, outstanding accounts that we've got. Um, I've got a colleague on the on the call who can answer any detailed questions about the timeline, but he he's produced a Gantt chart that scopes out when we think we're able to complete the audits by. That's on page 15. So you, you'll see that um, the 1920 audit is proposed that that will commence early in February of 2022, and you'll see. Um, the timeline for the other audits there. There is a contingency built in at the end um, because um, with any project like this, there's bound to be some slippage. So we're sort of um, suggesting that the process will what, be complete by the end of October, but with slippage and, and things, hopefully by the end of January. Um, we have had initial discussions with, with the auditors about the timeline. Um, but this is, this is where we are at the moment, but obviously, depending on when the 2018-19 accounts get signed off, it may or may not have an impact on, on this timeline. Um, so I don't know if there's any questions on, on, on this or comments. Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, looking at page 15, um, I think it's it's very much done with the spirit of, of the recommendation that was received by full council about um, when we hoped to be catching up and getting up to date. Um, but given, given the experiences of, of committee over the previous few years, I, I think it would be, um, 
it's relevant, I should ask, and, and challenge how realistic this is and whether we have the resources to, to implement it. Um, hoping, Chair, obviously, that the answer is going to be yes, but it'd be wrong not to ask that question, given the situation we find ourselves in. Um, so I think there may be a supplementary based on, on the answer given, Chair, but um, I really would like to know, do we have the resources in place to implement this, and, and are we being realistic here? Thank you. So, yeah, so I believe we do have the resources in place. Uh, my colleague is on, on the call who might be able to give a bit more detail. But him and his uh, colleague, who we recruited recently, have got considerable experience in, in delivering these sort of situations. They've, they've got experience with other authorities. Um, uh, you know, I think we're, we're, we're very clear on what we need to do, when we need to do it by, we need to liaise with the auditors. Um, I don't know whether, James, you want to come in and comment on, on this uh, at all. So this is my colleague, James Carter. So he's, le he's leading on the getting the accounts up to date. Um, so um, I don't know whether people have met him, but um, he's got considerable experience in this sort of thing. So. Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, uh, comment on on this. Um, in um, in that report uh, before you, um, I, I, I do comment um, on the um, action that um, SCDC have, uh, have have taken to uh, to ensure that they have uh, adequate resources and how those resources uh, could be identified by effectively. Um, uh, 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 putting back uh, s some of those uh, requests for um, uh, information, which tend to delay um, the um, uh, auditors uh, completing, back to the um, individuals uh, within the finance team that would would provide that, and that would, that gives them the opportunity at that stage to be able to assess whether they can handle that additional information request with their business as usual. Uh, and uh, as they currently find themselves in the uh, budgetary um, uh, preparation process. And um, uh, the uh, officers have uh, agreed to provide um, uh, additional out of hours uh, uh, work, which we've identified um, already in the process. Uh, information has been uh, coming in after normal office um, hours. So it does appear to be working satisfactory at the moment, but that also gives those individuals an opportunity to take that up with their, uh, uh, their department uh, heads if they felt that they weren't able to, and then they would um, uh, be able to call for uh, additional resources um, with their uh, day, day to day. Um, my experience uh, of, of this and my colleagues experience of this with other authorities is um, the, uh, the uh, bringing in uh, uh, resource additional resources at, at, at high high level, uh, it tends to be counter um, uh, productive because uh, you find those that know are running around trying to uh, explain to, to those uh, new resources uh, what's what's uh, what's required, and it tends to be counterintuitive. I found in the past that this uh, method of uh, of, um, of putting it back to the individuals to produce the information. Um, and then they can ask for resources for their additional day-to-day um, uh, -day business as usual is, is the better better route. And um, although there is three three or so months um, slippage uh, built in, uh, yeah, depending on uh, there are a lot of dependents, but depending on EY and depending on the closure of eighteen nineteen, it's um, it's 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 uh, genuinely uh, achievable. For the authority to uh, get get back uh, up to date, in my opinion, within uh, within the period uh, outlined. Thank you, James. Councillor Williams. Thank you, and thank you for that explanation. Um, with and I, and I don't disagree with actually the the answer that's been given to me in in the practical terms and everything. Um, but with that in mind, can I ask how many how many people in the finance department have we got in on an interim or short term contract basis, um, and the extra resource we have, 
whether they are also interim and if so for how long please chair because we also know turnover is is if we're using that method which i agree with we also are reliant on those people being in place for you know for consistency purposes thank you chair thank you so um james and tracy two people who are involved are with us until the end of this uh, damn chart so we sign them up well we sign them up till uh, october i think um i need to double check that but um we clearly need them on board to drive this process through um so but they are both interims sorry chair if i can if i can clarify october is that october 22 or 23 22 because the chart goes up to obviously 23 so october 22 um and given given the method that's been adopted in other members of the team that aren't specifically in this how many of those are on interim basis one i think Let's thank you chair Any further tools? Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I think um, certainly our, our experience of uh, over the past um, few years in terms of the, the timelines is that we've um, we've we've the, the 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 timelines have tended to reach backwards constantly uh, with with new things being discovered. So I think whenever a, a schedule is put together, um, clearly there is some. Um, some of a, some buffer here for uh, for for uh, things that will be discovered along the way, but I think it's it's very difficult to put an an end point on particular tasks if you're you've got a, a, a sequence of unknown unknowns essentially that have been discovered, and I, I, I just wonder I know that a lot of work is going into the eighteen nineteen accounts um, that is um, uh, structural with a view to Getting them in a place where future years can be can be done on a more planned basis. I, th I think my question, Chair, is: Are we confident that when that's sorted out, that we'll be in a position where we can create timelines that we can largely stick to as a council in terms of um, the audit process? So I think um, the, the biggest issue with the eighteen nineteen accounts has an is the asset register. Once we've got that agreed, the process, once it's ongoing, is, is actually relatively straightforward. The, the, the biggest process is getting that asset register right. So I, I think there's no doubt that's been the biggest issue around these accounts. Once we've rolled that over and, and we're, we're, we're putting information in and we know that the starting point is correct, I think it will make things a lot easier. Um, there have been other issues around the audit, but generally I think the rest of the audit has gone a lot better than the previous year. But unfortunately, the, the issues with the asset register have rather overshadowed that. So I, I am confident that once the asset register is in place, correct, that that process will be much more speedy and much more, um, well, be, it'll be easier for everyone to follow, I think it's fair to say. I think picking up on something that Councillor Heather Williams mentioned earlier, um, my, my question would be, and from what James has said, we're, we're looking to essentially backfill the finance team so they a backfill can do the day to day and release resource into the audit. What what other demands are there outside of the audit in this time frame? I think it'd be useful to see. We've got an audit time frame, but where are the crunch points, whether it's releasing of budgets, finalising of, of, of documentation, where there are specific crunch points that will impinge on, on the finance team? So as regards the budget, I mean, that's the biggest other competing demand at the moment. Um, a lot of the detailed budget work has been done. Um, since. Um, since February, we've had uh, a deputy and 151 in chief accountant who will also be involved in the budget and the audit process. So we have got an additional person 
compared to what we had before. But I think the the main competing demand for the um, accountants on the ground should be pretty much complete by January. So um, I think we do need to keep this under review because potentially you know there could be something crops up where we need to get somebody in at fairly short notice. Um, we've got um, a number of agencies that we can go to to get resources in fairly quickly. But I'm, I'm relatively confident that um, you know once we're over the, the main detailed budget process, this focus then switches to myself and the deputy uh, head of finance to prepare all of the papers so they will then have a little bit more time to deal with all the queries. But I think we do need to keep it under review pretty much on a week by week basis just to make sure that that is the case. And if we need additional resources, we'll have to move fairly quickly, I think. And, and a second question is, this This is our time frame. Do we have a time frame from, from the auditors? So I think we've, I think we've discussed this in, in sort of in, a, in an overall um, sort of fairly broad brush approach, but um, I don't know. Oh, I'm going to say I don't know whether Mark wants to comment, and he's just appeared on the screen. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. Um, so I think, as Peter alluded to, in, in the broad terms, we have no um, particular issues with the, the time frame that's been um, put before us. Clearly, the the key um, starting point in that is obviously finishing 1819 because we need. To, as with any audit process, we need a, a, a lead-in period before we come in and do your final accounts audit. So we have to do our planning to make sure we get our risk right. We need to obviously report the risk to the committee to make sure we're all happy with the, the audits where it should be. And then we can go in and do the, the final accounts work. So all that is predicated on us being able to finish 1819 in a period that allows us to do that before the you know the main audit blocks that's that's delivered in this Gantt chart. I would say from a um, as Peter has mentioned, just sorry if I'm, I'm okay, just just going back on a question or two. Um, so I think Peter's right that 1920, once the issues with the fixed asset register has been resolved, should mean a smooth approach process, and we're losing some of those key risks from the audit. I think for for an audit to run um, as well as it can, for, so all all of us as auditors want to go in on day one and, and leave on day X, however long that audit block is. Let's say it's a six week block and in essence find no issues, which would be nice because that would be a smooth audit process. And that's again predicated on the, the quality of the working papers that any audited body can can produce. So I think it's, it's down to the council to work out how it can um, ensure those working papers that they're delivering for audit are of that right quality. And I know the work that James and Tracy, his colleague, have been doing is obviously driving that forward. But that that's the position we would like to see, you know, going forward as auditors that we come in, that the working papers that support the balances that are presented in your financial statements are of a, a good quality to allow us to come in, do our work, tick each bit of the accounts off in a progressive nature, and then leave on that final day as we we've, we've planned um, um, sorry, I don't know if that answered your question, but in essence, yes, at the moment, the Gantt chart doesn't cause us any major concerns, but it is based on us obviously finishing the 1819 audit to have the lead in time into 1920 and then the subsequent years after that. Um, any further questions? Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Well, I, I didn't. It's the same question that I, I posed to, to our, our own finance department. I'd like to ask, as we've now got the external auditors with us, about the realistic realisticity of this um, page 15 and the resources, because it's very difficult for us sat here, Chair, I think, having gone down this process and been assured many things on many occasions and the reality being quite the, dip, the opposite. So... Am I right in, in what's just been suggested that EY, if the council complies and, and provides information in the time that it does, that EY have the resources also to adhere to this timetable? Because previously, obviously, EY's delays have caused issues. Thank you, Chair. So... 
we are I, I think as, as as Janet mentioned at the last committee we are um what's the word we are happy of it. we want to catch up with these audits as much as the council does because this the any on running audit not just of this council causes us issues because of a black log of audits which compounds any resourcing issues there are issues in the market generally about resources across all audit firms and across accountancy in general but as it stands at the moment um, we would be in a position to be able to resource as per your gantt chart um, to be able to complete those audits but as i say that would have to change depending on when we can finish 1819 off because obviously that will change the blocks where your audits are and then it's how we we fit that into our overall resource picture for all the other audits we've got going so for example we have key uh, points in time when our nhs audits need to be delivered um across end of april may so depending where the 1920 block moved back if that is what happens we'd have to look at how that then gets resourced in so currently we have the resources to be able to deliver if 1819 gets delivered in an appropriate time frame and signed off thank you chair yeah i mean i have to say i'm i'm nervous when i hear we want to catch up and get the resources because you know i'm sure many of us would want to be a millionaire but it doesn't mean it's going to happen um and so so if i have understood this correctly the resources are in place for this ey is, is guaranteeing us that they will not uh, distract from this timetable so long as we meet the 1819 deadline which is to have it finished by the december well 31st i guess of this of this month now i forgot to do the advent calendar this morning i'm in trouble <laughs> um but yes so we've got 31 days and then you you can guarantee that you will do this and have the resources in place yes so we we have resources booked in that's linked to these time frames as it stands at the moment based on delivery for this gantt chart thank you chair and thank you for that definite answer we don't normally get those it is appreciated <laughs> yes all things being willing with 1819 but I mean, it may be that we come on to it on, on the next agenda item, mm -hmm. but certainly my understanding is that the expectation is to try and complete in December, but we will not sign off until January. So I just want to confirm that, that the signing off doesn't delay the start. Would, would that would be my question? You're saying we've got, got to get all done by the 31st, but I'm, I'm aware now that although we have a best intention, the expectation is that we won't sign off until sometime in January. So does that cause then this, this position to be out of scope? Sorry, is that a question to me, Chair? <laughs> it's a question to you, Mark, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, so I, I think as per the, the, the Gantt chart, so that the, it shows sign off at the very beginning of January, which is what we're aiming for. And, and that's what would need to happen for the, the rest of, of that timing to, to then flow. Um, as you, you say, our report shows we are clearly still in progress on 1819. So assuming, yeah, that sign off doesn't get pash, pushed back further because of any further delays in signing off 1819 then we are currently in that process that the gantt chart would would show or the picture that that gantt chart shows so what is the drop dead date for signing so um not i don't have an answer for that but i can come back to the committee with it if we want a definitive end date before this starts getting kicked back is what i think you're asking tony yeah i think that that is what the committee really needs to understand is is that you know we have the reports here we understand the progress is being made 
there are still some outstanding items that we are providing information for and there is still audit work ongoing. Once that audit work is complete, there will then be a review of the accounts prepared and the notes and the technical papers that will then enable, assuming EY are happy with the, what is presented and reconciled, that then we will be in a position to sign off 1819. Given that we're talking about wanting to be in a position for 1920 and in the future years, we need to understand the drop dead date of when this committee meets to sign those accounts. Because that, that will be what, one of the things that we need to come to at the end of this meeting as well is what meeting date we have in mind for January to sign, to sign those accounts off. I think it'd be important for us to be aware of that. Councillor Williams. Yes, Chair, I, I'm just very conscious that what you said about from what, the point of view of our own committee and the fact that we have to give notice of agendas and things like that, and I believe it's working day notice and we've got a new year and a bank holiday and everything else, um, that if there is a date that it needs to be to be done by, if it's the 4th of January or whatever, if it's going to be that early in the year that's going to be needed, then I suggest we, we get a date in. Um, and that things aren't held up from not having the committee space. If, if ultimately things happen and it can't be achieved and that meeting can be postponed, but given the notice that needs to be given, um, maybe democratic services need to advise us as well as committee, Chair. I'll ask uh, Liz Watts to come in. Thank, thank you, Chair. And since I've spent a lot of time with the team over the last few weeks, I just wanted to clarify um, that, uh, that there are sort of two bits to this. Um, there's uh, completing the fixed asset register to the satisfaction of EY. And at that point, we can roll over the fixed asset register to start 1920. Um, everything else, uh, you know, there are 127 working papers that we need to do for 1920, of which we've done 70. So considerable work has already been undertaken on, on 1920, but we're sort of somewhat hampered by the fixed asset register and, and hopefully that will be resolved soon. I think the actual signing off of the accounts and this audit committee, um, while obviously it's critical in the process, once it's the fixed asset register that we require to get um, sort of um, landed so that we can make sure that all of the working papers are then um, completed uh, in time for the auditors to come in. So, so, so I just wanted to clarify those different things because actually there's loads of work that we can get on with between now and um, the end of January. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Given, given the advice that's just been given to us by, um, by our Chief Exec, can we pose this back to EY then as to what they mean when they say sign off? Um, and what their expectations are, whether it is a case of redressing the fixed asset register that's just been explained, but the statutory processes of signing off can follow, or do they expect when they say sign off for everything to happen, as there seems to be some amb ambiguity here? Uh, so the process we, we need to go through as an, an audit firm is, is we need to conclude on the work over the property plant and equipment. We need to get to a, a conclusion that the uh, that we're happy with with the council to be able to then report on the, the any issues or audit adjustments we've identified. We then would then need to obtain the council's final statement of accounts, reconciliations, new updates to the fixed asset register to reconcile that together. All that work would then need to be completed before we could and reviewed before we could look to then officially sign the audit opinion, which is what would we're talking about in early January. Um, Janet has actually just joined the call. I don't know, Janet, if you want to add anything to that. Thanks, Mark, and apologies, um, committee members, for for being late. I did have a clash and was just presenting another report as Mark was messaging to say that you you got onto this um, agenda item. So as, as Mark has explained, you know, we need to finalise our field work on the numbers and then adjustments need to be put through the accounts by officers and they need to do their quality assessment on that they have now got those right before we can then finalise our work to check that those have all gone through, complete our conclusion 
procedures which involve subsequent events reviews, um, letter of representation from management, you know, reporting back out to you the, the totality of all of our findings from this audit. Um, and then we'll be in a position once you've approved the accounts on that basis for, our, for us to uh, sign our opinion and provide that to you. I think the, the question's really of those timelines, at which stage can you commit to starting 1920? So, so it, it, is it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that you've, you've signed the rep letter, signed the accounts, it's come to a committee, it's all been approved, and then you can start, or is there an earlier stage in that process where perhaps you've you've issued your audit opinion, and you go, right, we've completed our bits. There is now an administration process to go through that has to be completed, but actually mm -hmm. we can now, having issued our opinion, start 1920, and what date is that in, in that timeline? Yeah, and, and this is the timeline on the Gantt chart, presumably, yes. that's been presented. Yeah, I mean, we, we, can, we can start our planning procedures you know, at, at any stage where we have resource available to apply to the South Cam's audit for 1920. The issue is that until your numbers have stopped moving and we're satisfied that your systems are reconciling into those, you know, there's very little point us starting another audit until we've got satisfaction that you've been able to stop the numbers moving, clarify what's in the various systems and get that right in the financial statements. Because Otherwise, we'll end up with, you know, open-ended audits running at simultaneously. And that really isn't um, a, a satisfactory or efficient way. And it actually puts extra burden on the officers because they then have to move between years. So from our perspective, you know, we're comfortable with the Gantt chart. If we can get satisfaction to close down 1819, we will then move quickly into getting through our planning work. What's essential though, is that the officers have produced a set of statements for 1920, that they are satisfied you know, of the quality and it reconciles back to the underlying systems and there's evidence, clear evidence trails to be able to support those numbers. So when you're ready, we'll start, but, uh, but I would like to close 1819 first because otherwise we'll end up with two years running and really, um, the, the difficulties that we're having in pinning down those final areas of the numbers means that you know it could have a knock-on impact into 1920, and so we'd end up having to you know duplicate the work, and that is not a satisfactory position to be in. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair, and apologies for the frustration in getting an answer to our question that we can all all agree on here. Um, but I, I'm just going to read. It says finish and audit sign off and and we've been told that for ey to have the resources we need to comply with this chart and i think categorically here we've got one we've got a great demonstration of how we're getting ourselves in a pickle time and time again because i don't think we're exactly clear on what actually the requirement is on on every part of the process so that sign off is it a case of your satisfaction or do you want this committee to have signed off those accounts? And if so, what is that date? We've been asked what you know, the drop dead date is. We still not had an answer to that. What, what do we need to do in early January in order to comply with this Gantt chart to ensure that everything else can follow in the time? Is it just address the fixed asset register or is it actually the whole full formal process? I just want a date we need to do it by. I want to know what we want we need to do by that date, Chair. I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't realise it was going to be that complex a question. I think I think the issue is how, you know, how how quickly can you give us the the last elements of information that we need so that we can complete our procedures. We've listed them out in our report. We had expected that we would have had answers to those questions the last time we met at the audit committee. You know, it's taken us to now to still not have the full answers to those, those questions. If that could be resolved pre-Christmas and a set of revised accounts produced, we could be signing them off at the next audit committee in January. 
So if you want a date that the organisation needs to aim for, you need to do this by the audit committee date in January. We'll sign them off at that point and then we can move forward. But if you can't answer our questions so that we can finish our audit, we can't provide you with an audit opinion. So you need to do this for the next audit committee date. That, there's your date, Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. So I'm fully aware and understand what we, what we need to do and that we need to answer the questions. The issue we have is we've been advised if we don't get to a certain point by early January, then EY's resources will change. I'm not, and I'm giving benefit of the doubt, I'm not sure if you were here for that part of the conversation. So mm -hmm. that's what we're asking. What is EY's cutoff of if you go past this date, we then cannot comply and fit our resources in the plan? Yeah. So you're so, saying that's the January audit meeting? Yeah. yeah. So if we have sign off of all the accounts before that meeting, that is our drop dead date in a sense. Yes, because if you miss that date, we will use our resources that we have scheduled for February to close down the 18, to continue to try to close down the 1819 audit. We won't start the 1920 audit without having closed the 1819 audit for all the reasons I've just given you about the inefficiency of running two audit years in one go. So we will have to reassign our resources that are on the Gantt chart for the 1920 audit to complete the 1819 audit. And that's when, you know, that's when we start to slip across this, this plan. Councillor Sample. Um, just, can I, uh, just to clarify then, um, EY, can I just confirm that EY requires that this committee signs off the 18, 19 accounts before um, you start on the next ones? That needs to happen. So the starting point for this chart is that this, the meeting of this committee where that happens and no work can begin by EY on the next set of accounts until that happens. Work could begin, but the point is it doesn't make any, it's, it's an inefficient process to do so. So I'm, st I'm telling you that I will allocate my resources to do the 1920 audit when we have signed off the 1819 accounts. Uh, just as a follow-up question, is that, because uh, we are trying to get to a start a, a date, um, because for us to be able to assess the viability of this plan, we need to know yeah. the starting date. So wh when you say we sign off, is that to EY's satisfaction that the 18, 19 accounts are, are complete, or is it the formal sign-off of this committee? What is the, what is, what are those two options? What is the start point for the, the work for EY on the next set of accounts? The start, practically, it is the former. So when we are satisfied that the accounts are ready to be signed, we can, you know, if the audit committee date is a couple of weeks after that, that's fine. We need to get to satisfaction on your accounts. We will then move to start 1920. If it's just a formal meeting of the, the, the committee that needs to approve those. My concern is that we've, you know, we set date. I'm trying to give you something simple to sort of focus on, which is your audit committee date, because then we might have a running chance of getting to that and getting these things signed off. Um, so, so that's the next hard date in the diary, in the calendar, um, which I'm suggesting you use as your indication that we start at that point. But practically, if we're all satisfied a fortnight before that, then we'll switch our attention on to 1920. Councillor Williams. I, I really don't wish to, to drag this out, but we don't have a date for January as a meeting. Well, can I suggest you put one in? Well, well I think this is, this is where the circle goes round. Sorry, I've got, I've got members laughing and, they, and it's infectious here. That's what we're trying to figure out here is what date do we put in the diary because we don't right. want to do a date that doesn't comply with your schedule because we've got sort of an orange bar in one out of four. So that's what we're trying to actually ascertain here is what dates do we need to put in? There's no point in us putting the fourth in 
if it's not going to be ready by then. But equally, if you need it done by the 17th, there's no point in us putting it on the 20th. So we are actually, in all of this carnage, um, trying to get a date for January. Um, so have you had any advice as to what a good date would be? I, and I'm going to ask anybody that's an no. officer internally, <laughs> externally at this stage. Chair? Just councillor sample. Um, my understanding of the, answer, the previous answer is that EY don't require this committee to sign off to, to have that meeting in order to get started with the 18, 19 accounts. So I think if you can confirm that's the case, then what we, what we need is um, that date, the date that the, 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 the 18, 19 accounts process, uh, hold on, we need the date by which the, 18, the work on the 1819 accounts has been completed to EY satisfaction. What is that date? And that's the date that you can start on the next set of accounts. Um, so if we know that date, we know the start date for this diagram. Well, I would suggest that you aim for the, the 14th of January in that case. But the issue is, and we've said this at every meeting, until we have the information from the organization, we cannot complete our audit. So I can give you, I can suggest that we should be done and finished by the 14th of January. But if I don't get the information in the next couple of weeks, then I, you haven't left me any time to complete my procedures. Do you see what I mean? It's a bit, you know, it's not chicken and egg here. It's I cannot sign an opinion on your financial statements if they are not if they do not reflect an accurate position and I haven't been given sufficient evidence to support the numbers associated with some of the fixed asset valuations and, and revaluation reserve, you know, if I, haven't, if I don't get that, I can't give you an opinion and therefore we could set any date you like. So, so perhaps we need to switch it back to the officers and say, when are we going to get this information so that we can complete our audit? Chairman, with your request, when are we going to get this information so we can give to the EY? I mean, my view on, as, we, as we've gone, gone around and trying to square the circle, is that we've got a date now, the 14th of January, and that date, if, if, if I'm not mistaken, is the date at which EY need to have completed the 1819 audit. It's not the date when we need to sign off as, as an audit committee. So, so we could set an audit committee date of after that 14th of January date, say the 21st or the 28th. The important thing from the audit committee perspective is if we hit the 14th of January and we have not completed, I want to have an audit committee to understand why we have not completed and what needs to be done to complete. And, and, and that, 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 that is why we're trying to understand the Gantt chart's a great start and it's outlining aspiration. But if we can't even agree the beginning point, it's a bit of paper. It's not adding anything. And, and, and that's where, as chair of the audit committee, I'm, I'm listening to the frustration of the members of the audit committee. We just want to have a date that if, if we miss, this is now going to be null and void, and we need to understand, as an audit committee, what happens beyond that date. Well said, chair. Uh, Chairman, with your indulgence, if I can ask Mr. Maddock, is that feasible, please? Yes, I believe so. I, I'm not. I might need to ask James uh, what information, because I'm not entirely clear what information you're still waiting for at this stage. Um, but no doubt James is. Um, but maybe that's something to, um, to to talk about straight after this meeting. James, do you have anything to add on that? Uh, um Sorry, uh, I'm just allowing for the uh, delay. I, I spoke uh, briefly with uh, uh, Mark uh, uh, before this uh, meeting, and um, uh, my understanding is there are four uh, four uh, points. There's the 1819 revaluation reserve, uh, EY looking at a 2.2 million uh, uh, difference. Second point is uh, uh, was the new value. Um, the surplus assets, uh, which we've submitted a paper and we're going to uh, amend uh, a, a number on that. Uh, so a very short. The third item outstanding 
is a section 106 uh, matter which uh, the um, uh, finance team are investigating and uh, fourth but probably um, can, can be quite easily dealt with was a uh, an update on on going going concern um, but but as always this 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 uh, closure uh, relies heavily on the um, 1819 fixed asset register uh, work being uh, uh, completed and uh, to, to to speed things up uh, i can just uh, let the committee know that um, that, that uh, EY Mark has has very kindly uh, agreed to uh, meet up virtually with um, what effectively is uh, South Cam's uh, capital asset uh, accountant Tracy Flack to uh, try to resolve these uh, final final points. The, uh, the the issue seems to be that that, that, that South Cam's stance is that that they are are, are correct. And are just having some difficulty in uh, answering the challenges of uh, e e e y. So, uh, so it, it, that's that, that's that's where we are. These are very uh, small uh, amounts. If, if you if you take into consideration um, that there are no outstanding items on the e y uh, portal, there there are no outstanding uh, uh, matters. The South Cam staff have, uh, subject to the fixed asset register issues, um, always prioritised their resources. They have uh, uh, produced client assistance uh, checklist, as uh, Liz mentioned earlier, uh, some 127 items uh, each uh, year, and they run uh, quite an extensive year enclosure checklist. And all of those items, including the uh, clear portal, um, have only left us with this uh, blessed uh, fixed asset uh, register um, uh, issue. Um, so, uh, in answer to your question, is the, is the fixed asset register item that's outstanding? We, we that is the finance team, believe that they have submitted uh, quite a comprehensive uh, reply to um, EY uh, during uh, during this week. But it has to be said, this is a very very complex uh, uh, area. Um, uh, made even more complex by the change from uh, an old uh, manual Excel um, spreadsheet fixed asset register to quite a sophisticated uh, SIPFA uh, uh, register. And it, it's really um, uh, quite time consuming uh, uh, to, uh, to get both sides to understand the uh, uh, complexities uh, so that the, the answers to the questions that, 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 that Janet um, alluded to earlier you know, can, can be given so that they can have a total confidence in that fixed asset register. I, I believe that's imminent and um, hopefully that can be concluded uh, uh, during, during this week. But uh, Mark and his team uh, uh, need uh, just a little bit more time to uh, uh, make arrangements uh, for uh, uh, a convenient meeting. But I hope that uh, answers your question. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, so a supplementary on to that is that given the outstanding items, is there anything in, in that list where we are relying on third parties or are there things that can be answered solely by the council themselves? I'm just thinking we've sometimes had to commission reports or especially the valuations and things. We've been relying on other other firms is everything now in in the control of the authority and reliant on the authority alone uh, should i answer that if you don't mind james i believe that's the case but that is the case there. yes yeah uh, there, are, there are no out as far as we're aware there's no outside of third party information required to uh, finalize those four points yeah, i mean i i'd uh, <clears throat> On the basis of what's been said now, we can then move. We've got a drop dead date from EY the 14th, and we can have an order committee after that date, and we can discuss that later in the meeting. Um, EY, from my recollection, need to have a minimum of two weeks with the data to be able to sign off. So we have EY saying they need to, they can sign off the 14th as a drop dead date. They, that means they need to have all the information by the 31st of December, all the information, all the files, all the notes, everything, given that it's 
Christmas and holiday, I would not expect officers to be working on the 31st of December. Therefore, there, there then becomes a, a potential drop-dead date of providing all that information, the notes, the accounts, for EY to start that review process to be in a position on the 14th of January to sign off. And that is probably going to be the 21st, 22nd of December. So, so today is the first, so we've got three weeks to get, get into a position of providing all the information. And the question then, then is, given it's taken a number of weeks to get to this situation, are we confident? And, and this is all about us being confident in this Gantt chart to go forward. Are we confident that we can deliver the information to the EY and respond to their queries in the next three weeks to be in a position for EY to complete everything and to get their audit sign, yeah, I say sign off, that confuses things, that they are confident and can move forward into 1920 by the 14th of January. So we have until the 21st, the 22nd of December as, as a, an example. So I'm confident, uh, I mean, the meeting with uh, between Mark and Tracy presumably is going to be the next day or so. I think we'll have a lot better idea then, but as it was, yeah, I, I'm pretty confident. But I think we probably need to have that meeting just, just to make sure that everybody else is, is satisfied. James, is it, does that sound reasonable? Uh, thank you, Peter. Yeah, it it it, it does uh, sound since it sounds uh, achievable, but yeah, I'd qualify that by by saying it it you know, it, it it just depends what continues to um, uh, come out of the um, uh, EY uh, investigation and sampling of whatever we uh, uh, provide them 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 with. If uh, in an ideal world, if um, if if the meeting uh, concludes that everybody understands these complexities and we can uh, plug those numbers in and move forward, no problem. But if, if because it's such a complex um, area um, that, you know, to get a, a fuller understanding, more information is, is required, you know, it's going to push the um, uh, uh, deadline or drop dead date, as you call it, uh, even further into the, uh, into the future. Um, it's I, it, you know this this crystal ball gazing. It's it's very difficult. I, you know I can hear the frustration you know, from the committee and uh, EY, and, and probably you sense that even from uh, 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 myself. But uh, it is it is so difficult to to give you know categoric you know, uh, commitments and guarantees with so many um, unknowns. But it is but to answer it is it is it is. It is possible and it is practical, but yeah, there are uh, there are going to be um, uh, trip ups, I guess, or well, potentially there could be. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. I, I appreciate you allowing me to come back again on this. Um, I, I think what we can see is that there's a lot of will around the Gantt chart. Everyone thinks it's potentially doable, but like I say, we're not going to get the guarantees. So if, if I may make a suggestion, Chair, that we note the um, progress, looking at the recommendation, we note the progress in relation to the 1819 audit and the 1920, and we do note the Gantt chart, but I would request that the Gantt chart at our next meeting returns to us so that we can look at it again, because then we will know if we've met that first stumbling point or not. I think um, as much as I, more than anybody else, I'm, and I'm sure everybody here wants some certainty. The reality is that I don't think we're going to get that today. Um, so I don't think I can have confidence in that chart until we've seen the first, the first, um, the first element completed. Um, so I'd ask that it comes back and we, we look at it then, Chair, if, if you're in agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, I think uh, the, the situation is, this is, as I said earlier, this, this is an aspiration. It will be affected by the conclusion of 1819. And, and therefore, if we are successful, it won't change. If you are not successful, 
it will change and have to be brought back to the to this committee to review and understand the impact of not being successful has on both the resource of the team and the resource of EY. Yeah. Thank you, Lee. Okay, so, so thanks to Peter Maddock for his report. Uh, we note the progress made in relation to 1819 and 1920, but we do request that uh, pending the next month that a, an updated Gantt chart is presented at the next meeting when hopefully we'll be signing off the accounts, but we need to be aware of when that is and the delays that may, may arise. If we, if we can have a five minute comfort break, is that okay for everybody? Yeah. And, then, and then, then we'll move on to item seven, the extend order update. So we'll just have a five minute break. Thank you.
Thank you, everybody. If we come back to the committee, please. And uh, we'll move on to item seven, which is the extend order to update. And then may I ask Janet Dawson to present her report. Thank you, Chair. Um, I think that a number of the items have already been covered in um, the previous discussion, actually, in terms of Peter, um, sorry, James Carter's uh, description of the four key areas where we're still awaiting information, which we set out in our report um, for you in the executive summary. So what we try to do here is give you, you know, some more detail about the issues that are underpinning the outstanding um, items and uh, the potential um, options for closing out those issues if we can't get um, satisfaction. So if it would be helpful, we'll just take you through each of those in turn so that you've got a clear view as to what we're waiting for. Um, James described them as minor items. However, the issue for us as auditors is that, you know, a number of them are could have a material impact on the financial statements and therefore would have an impact on our opinion if they're not resolved. Um, and another um, couple of those are part of our overall testing um, that we do uh, for, for example, creditors, balances that are in your accounts. And having set our testing strategy, if we then cannot complete it, it means that we haven't got assurance over that particular area. So whilst the numbers, the items that we're trying to get evidence to support might not be material, they add to the overall assurance that we get for that particular area of the financial statements. And therefore, you know, without them, we can't then conclude the audit. And that's the significance of the items that we've set out here. So if I just take you to our page four, um, we talked about the revaluation reserve already in the meeting today, and there's a balance um, of 4.2 million um, in there, which um, we believe um, is incorrectly um, stated. So we need a prior period adjustment to be made to the financial statements to correct that item and to include additional disclosure for the reader of the accounts to understand why that arose and what the correction has been in the accounts. The item on page five also relates to the revaluation reserve and it's the 2.2 million difference that um, James talked about earlier, and we are still seeking to understand how that 2.2 million difference between what's reported in your 1718 accounts and what's now being reported as the opening balance in your 1819 accounts and linked to the new fixed asset register, how that has come about. And we've raised a number of detailed questions, as James said. Um, to try and help officers work through the explanation as to how that has arisen between the old system and the new system and why they are satisfied that the new system position is correct because it's not what was reflected in the previous year's accounts. Um, and that is a material, a material number. Um, so what we've, whilst we've received an enormous amount of information and a number of different reports from officers to try to um, indicate to us what has caused this difference. What we haven't had is the officer's explanation themselves as to how they've worked through that and which reports and which numbers on which reports come together to provide that explanation. And so it's difficult for us as auditors to pick up half a dozen reports and work through them ourselves to piece together the officer's high level explanation. What we need is them to do the work to demonstrate it to us. And that's been part of the difficulty, part of the hold up. Um, so what we've done is provide an example working paper to, hope, to help officers set that argument out clearly for us so that we understand which figures they're drawing from where and how that comes to the, the difference. But without that, it's very difficult to follow. And as James says, it's very complex, but we do need that work to be done within the organisation first. On page six, we talk about the nil value surplus assets. Um, and I think I'll pass over to Mark at this point just to explain that one and then the uh, the final points on the fixed asset registers. Yeah, thank you, Janet. So um, the nil value surplus assets, we reported this back in uh, at the September committee. So this, so the council, so it was identified that the council was holding some 259 nil value surplus assets. 
Uh, the council has subsequently done work in se September and um, concluded that 158 of those the council still owns, um, the rest being disposed of prior prior to the accounts. The council have got an external valuation on the 158 assets. Uh, so surplus assets should be valued as per accounting standards as, at fair value, which is their highest best use value. But the valuation that's come through from the external valuers is an existing use value. And that's because um, due to the nature of the assets, it's the, it's not possible for the council to determine the future development pe potential, which would be what links it to its highest best use. Uh, therefore, that increases the level of estimation uncertainty and the council need to add a disclosure into their sources of estimation uncertainty note to describe that situation. So the council will update their accounts for the 900,000, which is the, the base existing use value of those assets, but then we'll need an additional disclosure to link to the fact that that 900,000 has a higher level of estimation uncertainty. And then on point three, the data transfer. So part um, of the work we need to do is obviously test the that the transfer of data from the old fixed asset registers has been migrated across completely and accurately into the new fixed asset register. Um, part of that work is 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 covered as part of the revaluation reserve, for example. But we are just finalising our testing of a sample of 25 items, um, so that's 25 individual assets, to make sure that data has been moved across. Um, correctly into new fixed asset register. Uh, there's no issues coming out of that at the moment, but that work does just need to be finalised. And then just moving on to the next page, page seven. So once items one, two and three have been concluded on, the council need to update their fixed asset register with all the updated figures and provide reconciliation to how that translates into a new property plant and equipment note for your 18th 2018-19 statement of accounts. Uh, clearly, that's that's based on having the uh, points one, two, and three cleared to make sure that that um, fixed asset register is a, a true reflection of the position for 1819. Do you want me to? Sorry, Janet. Do you want me to carry on to the next bits, or do you? Do you want to yeah. Do you want to cover the 106 as well? So. In addition to the uh, property plant and equipment issues at the bottom of page seven, there are some other outstanding areas too of those I think we've mentioned or James mentioned already, which is the section 106 balances held in creditors. Uh, so back about this time last year, we identified that there was some creditor balances which were developer contributions that looked to have been reversed out of 1718, then brought back into 1819. Uh, initially, the council thought that that was a again another prior period adjustment for 1718, but now believe it's just a disclosure issue that we've not um, received the council's final determination and evidence to support that assertion as yet. So we're still waiting for that information. And going concern is another area where we need to update. So we had a assessment back in July, but clearly time has passed and various announcements have happened. So therefore, we need an updated assessment. Ongoing concern taking into account anything that's happened in the intervening period so that we can um, assess or form our opinion on that assessment and the disclosures the council have made in their accounts. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. I've, I've got some things in the report, but it's just something I want to clarify on what was said first, if I may. Um, in relation to the nil value surplus assets, I appreciate it's difficult via the virtual, so I'm, I'm not quite sure I, if I can clarify what you said. Um, it sort of seemed to imply that you were still waiting for information in relation to valuation of assets, at which point we would then be reliant on a third party. Um, and, and that's why I'm clarifying it, because obviously previously you've been told that we're not relying on any third parties. But equally, you were speaking quite quickly and may have oh. said that you'd not um, needed that. So can I just clarify, are you still waiting on valuations which would be provided by externals? You're, you're not, are you? Are you? No, apologies for that. Um, no, we are not waiting. So the, the council has had a third party valuation and it's the, the outcome of that valuation that leads to our outstanding, which is the council need to update date their accounts. So we are not, the council is not waiting for any third party evidence to support those surplus assets. Yeah, but my understanding is, is that 
it, 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 it's, it's the methodology that the, that the third party valuer has used to come up with a 920,000 valuation for the surplus assets. But the accounting standard says you have to, you should use best use. Now we haven't used that, so we have to disclose why we didn't. Now, my question from that is, what, what is the difference? Because it, we can only estimate, but if, if it is a, a substantive difference of, we've got it valued at 920,000, but if we if the best use, it would be 5 million. That's such a, a range, it becomes a, a material uncertainty. So best to go with what is more reasonable and prudent than a, a, a best use value that is dependent on so many other things. It's, it's unrealistic, but you know, the, the principle is we we've got evaluation from a third party. It's it's been I'm going to say accepted and agreed and, and and reviewed and signed off by the auditors. But for disclosure purposes, we need to disclose that we are not complying with accounting standards in our estimation and uncertainties and notes. That's that's the principle of it. If I understand it correctly. Thank you, Chair. I, that was my understanding, which is why I wanted to clarify that based on, on the introduction, because I thought it wasn't consistent with that. Um, I do have questions on the report, but when, when you're ready, Chair, am I okay to? Thank you. So, Chair, some of these will be um, for our external auditors and some maybe for uh, Mr Maddox or internally. So, first of all, on page five, uh, we have about this comes under the revaluation reserve um, I think we also actually should stress that obviously some of us have, have got financial backgrounds and, and what have you but that some people might think we literally lost 2.2 million pounds worth of cash that that isn't how it is it's just valuation of property so we're not talking about actual cash I think that's important for um, particularly members of the public looking um, looking at this to to understand these are accounting adjustments um, but the, the third to sixth paragraph are, are quite concerning. I think this is an internal question. Um, it says, we were originally told by the council that all of the historic data since 2007 was on there. Then subsequently, we said it was 2011, and then it's found out that we were in 1617. So that, that is concerning, obviously, Chair, that we, we, are we definite now on that information and we know when it's for and, and everything else, um, and some sort of have we understood how that confusion has arise so that lesson can be learned from that. So I think that's that's the first first question. Um, the other thing on on the nil value surplus page six, it says about not having been revalued within the last five years. In going forward, and perhaps the new software does this for us automatically. Do we have some sort of expiry, valuation expiry dates recorded so that we make sure we keep up with that? Because I, I think that is important, particularly given that we own land in South Cambridgeshire, which, you know, and the economy changing and fluxing as it is. Um, so that would be my second question, Chair. Um, third question is uh, in relation to the comments that were made about a referencing system, some bookmarking system or something to enable the external audit to go quicker, if perhaps we can have a response on that and, and have some assurance that that's going to be taken on board and, and implemented. Uh, two more I've, I've got, Chair, and then I, I shall silence myself for a little while. Um, page six, bottom paragraph about the migrations of data. It says that there were no formal processes or controls put in place by the council um, and that the external auditors are still to consider the impact. Can we, can we be assured that processes and controls and policy is now in place? Because I, I did read that with, with some alarm. We all know that one of the most dangerous times for, for data and, and corruption of data is in migration processes. Um, and my understanding is that it came out, it went back in, and it came out again. So we've got three potential exposures to that. Um, and that, that is very concerning. We, we need to ensure that doesn't happen again. And particularly with that paragraph in mind, Chair, it leads me to my last question, which is um, from Ms Dawson on page three. Uh, to date, we have not issued statutory recommendations on the above. But... 
the way that's worded, I'd just like to clarify, does that mean that our external auditors are still considering issuing statutory recommendations? Um, and if so, can we have some assurance that one of the things not being considered potentially is, is negligence based on that paragraph on page six, six about the um, processes and controls? Because obviously negligence is a very serious, serious thing that we ought to be um, aware of uh, if, they're, if they are looking into that chair. Um, so I think that's, that's my questions for now on this report. Thank you. I think there's some responses first from Peter, and then we'll go to the external auditors for their response. Well, I'll try and remember the question, questions. I think the first one was around um, misunderstandings. Um, so I think there clearly have been some misunderstandings along the way. Um, I'm, I'm confident now that um, both ourselves and the auditors understand the position that, you know, if there were misunderstandings, then that is regrettable. Clearly, they seem to have been. Um, so I can only apologise for that if that's been the case. Um, sorry, what was the second question? <laughs> the, sorry. Um, the second question that I believe would be um, directed to Mr. Maddox was about um, an expiration date for revaluation and, and valuations, whether we're recording that. Um, and then the other one that I feel is probably applicable um, is about the referencing system, if, if that's been pursued, and whether there is now formal processes and controls in relation to migration of data. So, um, as regards um, formal processes, uh, obviously um, we, have, we now do have formal processes in place internal auditor are looking at that as well so we will seek advice from them because they may well have some recommendations uh, as a result of their exercise so i think that would be quite valuable to hear what they have to say because obviously they're independent you know they're, they're independent from the actual people doing the register so i think that will be quite helpful uh, in, in informing you know, making sure all of our processes going forward are robust um, as regards uh, the migration of data, I mean, the migration itself was carried out back in 2018. We can't find any evidence of, of the project plan, which again is regrettable. Um, myself and the capital accountant weren't here at the time anyway, but equally we do need to go back and see if we can work out quite why that was the case, you know, why we didn't have a plan, if indeed we haven't, if we say we found no evidence of that. <laughs> And quite clearly, any migration of data needs to have a clear plan, clear testing, uh, and, and just to make and, and sampling, you know, of the data just to make sure that the, that's been accurate. So um, that's something we clearly need, we clearly need to, to do. Uh, the other point I think you raised was around valuation timings. Uh, um, now, um, certain assets have to be valued every year, like our housing stock, like our investment properties. Uh, other valuations you would revalue um, as and when there was some evidence or, you, or some belief that that value may well have changed since the last year. So it's, you know, so my, my view would be that on these uh, surplus assets, for example, we would review them every year just to check what's happened in the intervening period and whether there was any reason uh, to suggest that the value of those assets had changed. So my, my view would be that we would we would review those every year as part of the final accounts process. Um, was that everything? Or, oh, sorry. Um, so the other thing was about the referencing system in, in the documents that was um, listed in the introduction by external auditors. Is that something that's been shared with yourself and and potentially be looked at. So with the working documents that was, they said it was difficult to reference where the cross-references. Oh, between all of the reports. Yeah, so I mean, I, I suspect as a result of the meeting between Mark and Tracy, um, that, that potentially that would be a, a place to sort of agree a, a, a good referencing system. Because one thing is for certain, you know, there's a lot of reports 
you know, it is quite difficult to follow through. And I think if there is a good referencing system, it does make it that much easier. So I guess Mark will probably have some recommendations along those lines uh, as a result of that meeting. So, yeah, that'd be good to have some good referencing system that makes it that much easier to follow. Yeah. That concludes my internal questions. Obviously, I had ones for external as well on my list. So if the EY can respond to the questions posed by Councillor Williams. Sure. So I think the, the question, just to recap, was um, about the point on our page, um, the, the bottom of my letter, rather, around not issuing statutory recommendations at this point. Um, so in classic external audit language, and I apologise for this, I will be considering statutory recommendations until I decide, determine whether I need to issue them or not. And actually, I'm not able to fetter my discretion in terms of um, you know, whether or not I am going to issue them at this point. So we haven't concluded the audit. There are still some as I see it, significant issues associated with the fixed asset register and that reconciliation and the information coming from it to be able to satisfy ourselves on the numbers in the accounts. And until we've got to a position where we understand that and have identified in particular this 2.2 million and what's causing it, you know, I'm not in a position to say whether or not you know, I think that that may lead to some recommendations associated with the way in which that data has been transferred controlled and managed um, so I'm, I'm leaving it open councillor Williams um, but as I said in my report I will in our final report set out very clearly all of our findings and conclusions and any recommendations that we have around making um, improvements to the, the control environment um, and if I think that any of those warrant statutory recommendations then I will signal that to the committee and move to that position I hope that's clear. There was one other before we add an IT issue onto our list. Um, that uh, with relation to section page six, um, section three with the processes and controls, is that something that AUI are, are looking at? Um, in their assessment and giving a judgment on, and I did reference whether you're looking at negligence at all. You did, yes, apologies. Um, so we, the, 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 the lack of controls that have been identified, as Peter has said, in terms of that migration of data, um, you know, we've, we've arrived at that view from a number of our questions and testing in terms of, you know, uh, items of data that were on the system or that weren't on the system and how that's been reconciled through. So as we've been moving through our work, we've identified a number of issues with incomplete data being transferred across and having to be corrected um, by the officers. Um, so again, in that overall view that I'm going to take, um, I will then assess whether or not, as I say, there are recommendations that are significant enough to warrant making them statutory. Your point on negligence is a is a very specific um, word which actually doesn't come into the um, auditors, the National Audit Office code specifically um, under the use of our special powers. Um, so so it's it's not one that is is part of my vocabulary. What I would need to do is have a look at the significance of the issues that we've identified and determine whether it's a question of making recommendations, making statutory recommendations, or then moving further on to um, you know a, a report in the public interest or what have you. But negligence in in and of itself is not a criterion within those categories. So it's not one that I would bring back to you at this point and say, I think you've been negligent as an organisation. I'm not responsible for uh, making that judgment within my role. Thank you, Chair, um, and appreciated. And perhaps if we could just clarify ourselves, who would be potentially, because obviously that is a significant risk. And if it is a risk, that feeds onto our risk register. Um, and so I would suggest, is, are we in danger of this in the current situation? I severely. 
think, uh, as has been mentioned earlier in this, in this meeting and at the last meeting, there, there, there will be a thorough review of the, the fixed asset register and its implementation process by an internal audit. And I would, I would certainly expect that from the internal audit's review, there would then be recommendations. I am aware that there, there are improvements that have happened more recently, but you know, we are unfortunately in a, an historical position of looking back to what happened in 2018. And some of the evidence that may have been in, in place in 2018 has, has unfortunately disappeared. Uh, and cannot be traced. So we, we are lacking certainly control and a, a control environment in the 2018 activities. They're being addressed now and internal audit will come back, I'm sure, with recommendations to avoid it happening in the future. Thank you, Chair. Councillor Sample. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, so just going um, back to the, what needs to happen in the next few weeks, um, on 1819. Um, the report references two things that are um, being, uh, that are currently with the council. So under point one, at the end of it, it talks about a number of detailed questions that the auditors have raised with the council. And under point four, under S106, uh, we're currently waiting for the council's final determination and evidence to support their conclusion on the point mentioned. Is, in terms of the, the actual next steps to, 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 to completing um, the audit, it, it, are those the two issues that you're waiting to hear back from the council on? Mark, do you want to just recap on the key areas? So, Point, um, so just moving to point one and the revaluation re reserve. So the, the response that we need in terms of those detailed questions for the 2.2 million is probably at this point in time, the biggest key issue that we need, because that's the one that has been referred to by James about being complex issue that we need to work through. And we, obviously we need to get to a position where we're happy that the 2.2 million difference that the council are proposing uh, as part of the PPA is correct. So that's that's the key issue that we're working through at the moment. But in addition to that, to get to the point of conclusion, as you as you rightly say, we need the council's determination on the developer contributions, the section 106, uh, so we can move forward and conclude on that. And I and and conclude where the error lies, whether that's 1718 again or whether it's just disclosure. Um, issues rather than a, a change in your creditors balances so but we do also need the update to the going concern assessment if we to conclude in in the time frame that we've discussed and I think also important to lay the the top of point four which is the final version of the fixed asset register and plant uh, property plant and equipment note that could be a lengthy um, task for the council uh, clearly, I don't, I don't know if Peter or James has an opinion on that, but pulling together all the adjustments that's been identified over the past, I don't know where we are now, 16, 17 months in regards to PPE, pulling all that together into a final fixed asset register, translating that into a new property plant and equipment note and all the balances that it affects in the accounts with all the related disclosures is also a, a, a key job that the council will have to do and will take a a time period for the council to do. Uh, the council may be in process of doing that as we go along. I'm not sure that's probably for Peter or James to respond to. Does, does that answer your question, Councillor Sample? Yes, I think so. Thanks. Yeah, it's the, uh, just, I think it's, it's really um, uh, goes to the question of uh, feasibility of um, getting from where we are now to where we need to be in three weeks. Thank you, Chair. Um, perhaps I should explain to Janet and to Mark, I'm not a member of this committee, uh, but as Chair of the Scrutiny and Overview Committee, I'm obviously uh, extremely interested. And I wonder if, if I might pose a question both to um, Ernst and Young and to, and to Peter Maddox. Can both of you independently give an assessment of the number of man days that you believe may be required to complete the submission of data 
uh, to the for the audit completion, please. In terms of in terms of completing this, if it was straightforward, if we received the information reconciled and set out clearly, I think we would probably take another twenty man days to complete the work. Because as Mark says, we're just completing the final testing at the moment um, on the 25 items that you know confirm that we're satisfied with what's in the fixed asset register. And then there are the key areas that we've discussed that we're still waiting for information, which we will then need to, both Mark and I will need to review, and we will need to look and check very thoroughly through the um, restated um, statement of accounts once we are in a position to receive that. So I would suggest it's about another 20 man days. Um, I was just trying to calculate quickly in my head, Councillor, because we we do this by, um, we usually calculate by hours, but we've used in excess of 400 days already on this audit, which is probably twice the amount you would expect for a district council. Thank you for that. Perhaps then I could pose exactly the same question uh, to Peter. I might need to ask James about how long it's going to take to update everything. I mean, James, do you have a, do you have a view on on how long it would take to to process the adjustments? I'm just thinking ten ten man days. What, what do you think? Yes, uh, uh, Peter. I, I I think we we have discussed this briefly um, in 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 the past, and I, I I've tried to um, give um, uh, give you and uh, and and Liz a uh, comfort that the the total package is is in in its final uh, state. That's the uh, statement of uh, accounts subject to the fixed asset uh, register uh, being updated. Now, in, in terms of um, uh, I'll just give a brief outline of um, how, how this uh, this works. Uh, once we've got an agreed fixed asset uh, register um, position, uh, Tracy Fleck will upload uh, that through the SIPFA AMS um, fixed asset register accounting routines. Uh, generally, that can be done um, by, by her um, uh, on, online. And, uh, and and should take no more than uh, overnight, so one uh, one one working day. Once that new uh, format uh, is um, arrived at, I can plug that into the um, uh, statement of uh, accounts by virtue of a, a rerun uh, trial trial balance. Um, and uh, as Mark mentioned, uh, it will affect certain other areas, but that will be done automatically through the. Um, uh, trial balance uh, run through uh, uh, Tech One, which is the uh, current accounting uh, program system. So I, I, I think, as, as we have discussed previously, uh, uh, 10, 10 working days is um, is sufficient uh, once we've finalised those uh, four outstanding uh, points that uh, um, EY have outlined um, earlier. Okay, may, may I come back on that? Because obviously that response was fairly highly qualified. Um, what I'm really looking for, James, is an indication of the number of man days that it will take us uh, to complete the submission of the uh, all the data to EY. Because um, from my own experience of some years ago receiving an audit report um, not quite along these lines, but uh, with a similar slant to it. It actually uh, involved a huge amount of work, and I am worried um, that there is a lot of work to be undertaken in the next three weeks, and that um, is sort of 15 working days, but how many man days are actually required to complete the submission in full to EY? Thank you. I'm sorry, I don't have any calculations based on uh, uh, man days. I, I, I can only look forward um, in terms of working uh, working days.
chair, someone really needs to um, understand exactly how many hours, how many man days are required to complete this information to submit to EY um, within the time period that you're talking about. Yeah, I think um, one of the questions when, when EY mentioned 20 man days was how many, how much resource have they got to fulfil that 20 man days? And, and is it sufficient and able to then to be deliver against the drop dead date of the 14th, assuming then that from our side, the council is able to work and deliver by say the 20th in the next three weeks, the, the, the requirements. And, and to, to, to your specific question, uh, when, you, when you raised it, I, I immediately sprung to my mind was well, how long is a piece, of, a piece of string? Because actually in an audit process, you get requests, you submit information, you get secondary requests, you submit information, it's, it's nothing's agreed until everything is agreed. And so we can sit here today and say, it will take 10 working days or 10 man days, and we've got two people, people working on it, that's five days. Seems, seems fine. Things will happen in the next five days that mean that it gets pushed further back, would be my understanding of, of all the audits I've ever been in. Um, but I, I would ask Peter for some, some clarification around whether that, that is a reasonable view to take. I think so. I think probably I need to have a have a discussion with you, James, and sort of fairly urgently after this meeting, just to try and scope out exactly how long we think it's going to take us. Um, and perhaps I can call back to the committee by the end of the week once we've had a discussion, just to just to make sure we're clear on what we need to do and when we need to do it by. So I'll catch up with you after the meeting, James, and we'll have a quick discussion. Thank you. If that's okay. That might be the best way to approach this. Okay. But then I, I'll, I'll um, if, if we can agree on a deadline of, of the, the end of this week, and, and I will circulate the, that information to, to the committee post receiving it from Peter, if, if that is acceptable to, to the committee. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I would appreciate if you could circulate it, most definitely. And I'm. I think I just want to clarify the interpretation, as I, as I understand it from Councillor Chamberlain, is it's not about the subsequent things, it's the manpower to just make this initial series, if that makes sense. We, sh we, and we should know that, really, if, if we, to, in order to evaluate if we've got enough resources or not, um, is, is my view. So if, if you can look at that and address that, I think we all understand that sometimes more is then required, but we need some confidence we've got the resources in place to deal with what is in the here and now, to be honest. I mean, on, on if there's no, no further questions from anybody, I've, I've got a, a couple of questions um, for, for EY, and it, it comes back to certain things that uh, Councillor Williams raised, and, and it was on, on the, the issuance of the statutory recommendations, if, if you could clarify what those statutory recommendations could be right? because my my understanding from previous discussions was the statutory recommendations would be to escalate the audit and the management of the audit process from the audit committee to the council now the council has in effect had a meeting in october to to direct the council to address the issues on the time frame and delivery of the audit already so if there are any other elements of statutory recommendations, I think that'll be useful for this audit committee to understand what they are. And then you were talking at the final bit of that paragraph about if further reporting under, the, under those statutory powers is required. So, so if you could clarify, you know, it may be that you can't specify, but if you could clarify what further reporting could that be, so that's that we are aware of, of the, the, the impact of, of that, the, the effect that those statutory powers may have. I mean, a concern that I have is, is that, of course, it gets reported in, uh, in the papers that the council is facing special measures. Now, special measures has a distinct quality to it that an individual understands 
from thinking that schools are going to be taken over and taken out, out of the council. Now, special measures isn't, as far as I'm aware, what we're talking about. It's statutory powers, and that isn't statutory powers of EY or A and other audit company coming in and taking over the finance responsibility for the council. But that may be what people interpret it as being. So I'd just like clarification so that we, the audit committee can be clear as to what those statutory recommendations could be and what the statutory powers could refer to. Certainly. So um, the, the, the last sentence there is actually talking about you know, statutory powers as in making some statutory recommendations. So um, as I said in my um, letter, in our uh, um, audit results report, we will set out everything that we found. And then at that point, we'll go back around that loop and say, is there anything within that report that we think has such significance um, that it's important that we exercise our statutory power? So I was, if you look at um, the audit, the auditor's guidance note um, number seven, which the NAO puts out, it sets out very clearly on their website the, the hierarchy of special powers that the auditors have, which start with making recommendations to the organisation that then go on to um, using Section 24, Schedule 7 of statutory recommendations. They then go on to, in the same section, um, issuing a public interest report where you feel that a matter has not been disclosed sufficiently for the local taxpayers and in the public to be understood. It then goes on to being able to apply to a court have an item um, declared um, illegal, an item of expenditure illegal. And so there's a there's a range and there are probably one or two others that I haven't um, mentioned now, but but they're all set out really in a hierarchy there. So so my point in making that um, statement where I say at that stage, we will also conclude whether we need to make further recommendations and if further reporting is required is I will go back to the start of that hierarchy and I will consider whether or not I need to make any statutory recommendations. At this point, I haven't seen anything further that would lead me to move through that hierarchy any further than that. So just, just to put your minds at rest at the moment, it's a question of do I feel that the council needs to pay attention to where we've got to, what we've found, and is there further action required? That, um, Chair, you're completely right that earlier we were talking about actually an escalation process and the overall governance of the closure of the 1819 accounts and you know I think we've moved significantly on that because we are having very open discussions um, about what next needs to be done there's escalation the audit committee is paying close attention and milestones are being put in place to to ensure that the process moves forward um, one of the points though that I discussed with Liz um, is the value in making recommendations, and if we think they're sufficiently significant, statutory recommendations, is to help the organisation focus on what improvements are required going forward. And so the nature of the recommendations that I would be considering would be about, do you need to strengthen the resource in your finance function further? Do you need to ensure that there is adequate um, financial um, uh, what's the word, understanding throughout the organisation and control environment throughout the organisation so that the finance function can extract the information they need quickly to meet their responsibilities around financial reporting. Um, and is there still a need for a more formalised, structured monitoring process of milestones, governance, escalation, etc., going forward to catch this backlog up? So it would be about what can you do to get a really um, formal structure in and around this process to recover the position in terms of late reporting. So those are the types of recommendations that I'd be considering. Hope that's helpful. Yeah. Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, um, I think the word special measures is a very specific reason and that no single councillor I would like to think in this council of all parties and then wants this council to go into special measures. It, it's an extreme case and I think it would be fair to say that we would all councillors would feel we have failed should we, the council do that. It's not something anybody wants. 
admittedly, we, we have opposition, and sometimes we like to embarrass the opposition, and I'm sure they do exactly the same to us, which is fine. But nobody wants that. Nobody wants that, and everybody wants to work to keep us as far away from those two words as we possibly can. And it's a bit like the unwritten rule, I think, the MPs have about talking down the pound. I think it'd be fair to say that all councillors have the same with regards to that. This is no way does anybody want to go down that route at all. And um, we look forward to helping uh, EY as much as possible to get all this resolved. Yeah, perhaps if I can um, also just, in terms of the, the vocabulary of special measures, it's again, it's a bit like the, um, we were talking about the use of the word negligence. It's not one that is features in the regulations that structure the work of the external auditor. So um, we talk about you know, our special powers and, and the hierarchy of different actions we can take. Um, special measures would be something that would be enforced by the department on the organisation and is, is not within our remit, if you see what I mean. So um, that might be a consequence um, if we were to find something so significant, but um, it's not something that the external auditors themselves um, enact or um, inflict on an organisation. Any, any further questions? Uh, the committee is asked to note the report from external order and I thank Janet and Mark for their attendance today and uh, for explaining things so clearly. Thank you very much. Thank you. We now move to uh, agenda item eight, the internal order to update report. Uh, may I ask Jonathan Tully to present his report? Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Chairman, for letting me introduce this update. Um, Although I'd like to recognise this is a joint effort across the broader team of the Council to uh, prepare this item. Um, so we're on page 17 of your agenda packs and the purpose of this document is to provide summary updates to you um, across topical audit and governance themes. We also include some statistics at the uh, end of the document to help provide an overview of uh, work in progress. Um, hopefully the content of the report is fairly clear for you to follow, um, but this is the second uh, report of the style that we've completed, so we always welcome feedback on the content and presentation. So I'd just like to highlight a couple of points of interest, if I may. Um, moving into the section Governance, Risk and Control on page 19, um, you can see that since the last update we've completed two internal audits, um, one of which was reported via the Scrutiny and Overview Committee. Um, both have an assurance level, um, which has improved since our previous reviews. They've both improved from limited to reasonable. Um, also on that page, um, we highlight that we, we also undertake proactive and responsive work to help protect the public purse, and we do that through various data matching initiatives, and we've just highlighted a couple of those projects in the reports. Uh, moving on also in that section, we just provide a highlight of some of the upcoming audit work um, which is happening over the next quarter. Moving on to the counter fraud updates, which is on page 21 of the reports. Um, Tyron Lutbin King, our fraud team manager, has provided some helpful statistical updates on counter fraud activity. And then um, finally on page 25, under the training and development section, um, you'll see that um, we've introduced some guidance on primary and fraud prevention, and Tara's worked with a number of officers across the council to prepare that guide. Uh, that follows on the next pages 27 to 44, and we hope that you find that useful. Um, those are the only points that I wanted to cover, Chairman. Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Yep. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I just want to ask a couple of questions. I did find it very useful, and I thank you for the guide um, for councillors as well. Our councillors guide for bribery, um, two bribery, I should say, not for bribery, two bribery and for prevention. Thank you very much. That's much appreciated, Alice. Um, just a, a question, and I, I appreciate it's a minute type question, but uh, you'll see why I'm asking this particular question. On page 23, under interview, under caution, 
it is noted there that seven people failed to attend the interviews. Could, um, is it possible for Mr. Tully to give us any information on that, if he has any, um, specifically what happens when people don't turn up? And I have another um, recommendation, uh, depending on what Mr. Tully says, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councillor Hal. Um, I'm afraid I cannot answer on that question. That comes under the remit of the fraud team. Um, I don't know, Peter uh, Maddox, if you want to pick up a response on that or whether that's something we want to bring go away and bring back to the committee. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I think I'd probably best go away and speak to, to my fraud manager and see what she has to say on that and provide a response, if that's OK. Uh, Chairman, thank you very much indeed for that. I only ask, I, I ask that specifically because um, if people don't turn up, I would like the portfolio, sorry, the lead member for finance and the lead member for housing or anyone else that um, uh, this might be relevant to. If they are in seat of benefits and they don't turn up for interview, we should look at withholding those benefits until that interview um, appears. But I appreciate, Chairman, that's a very, very specific clause to do with different portfolios, but I would just like the portfolio for finance, sorry, the, the lead member for finance who's here to consider that when he is um, looking at things in the future. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, and just for ambiguity as well, given what's often said about councillors, I did wonder if it's a councillor's guide to detect bribery and fraud prevention. <laughs> it almost would have implied it's a guide to help us do it, which obviously I would expect not one councillor in the country to be actively doing right now. Um, so, yeah, maybe a, maybe a change, of, change of name and uh, potentially a change of suit, actually, on the, on the photograph, um, given the... Yeah. On to more serious matters, on page 34, it, this is one of, of interest and it, it's, it reads, you are responsible for ensuring that your authority adequate, adequately manages its risks and that local residents receive value for money. And I'm just wondering how, how you judge that because value for money is, are we, is this an in, interpretation purely on a financial basis? Because I think it's quite a, value for money is quite a subjective thing. You know, what one person puts strong emphasis on, another wouldn't. Um, and we obviously have a value for money strategy. Um, so I'm just wondering, where's the benchmark, would you advise for that? Uh, or on this basis, are we simply sort of cost effectiveness? So um, as regards the risk of fraud, we're, we're doing quite a lot of work across the authority identifying key risk areas um, and as part of that um, we'll be trying to put a, a value on um, each detection of fraud and each possible uh, saving that that might make. Um, we still got some way to go we're going to be doing some benchmarking with other authorities as well to see what they're doing. Um, I think it's fair to say that the fraud team is, is evolving. Um, the team is set up last year um, and obviously with the pandemic um, things have been quite slow and, and it's been quite difficult to, to carry out fraud uh, investigations and prosecutions so we're still working things up at this stage but you know the intention is to, to do some benchmarking to complete the fraud risk assessment so that we make sure that we target the right areas uh, to look at in a bit more detail so there's quite a bit of work going on uh, and part of that process will be trying to assess uh, the sort of um, financial benefits of doing what we're doing, if, if you see what I mean. Councillor Williams. Thank you. So, just as, a, as an adjunct to that, the reason I ask it is, um, I'm going to give an example of planning enforcement, because um, it's somewhere that we have this sort of balancing act, and often what's referred to as the expedient, is it expedient to take action, you know, on a balance of of harm, even though it perhaps has broken a rule, do we, is it expedient to pursue it or not? Um, I have to say that when it comes to such matters, fraud prevention and detection, um, expediency, it, you could very easily go, well, it's X amount, it's going to cost us more to pursue it, and it sort of gets wrote off and justified. For myself, fraud 
fraud is very much something that, re regardless of how much it is, it's it's you know it's a disservice to residents. It's a principled matter. So I would put high value on on us demonstrating that we will not accept that, um, and to be very tough on that, which might not always fit with the expedient and and you know that that value for money. So I suppose. Is it a conversation that, that chair we need to have as members or is it something that officers will define as to, to where that's pitched? Because if somebody is fraudulently taking taxpayers' money, then, then they need to know and should be pursued regardless of its value, monetary value. I think you make a very good point there. Um, as section 151 officer, I have a responsibility to say, uh, to cons make sure that council assets are, uh, are maintained, um, to safeguard those assets and, and for proper controls. And I, I, I tend to agree. I mean, there's, you know, as a public body, um, we should do everything we possibly can to put into fraud prevention, uh, fraud detection, and if fraud is found, to, to pursue that. Um, and say the fraud risk assessment will identify those areas that we that we need to to major in on. But I, I agree. I'm very clear that um, you know we do need to pursue fraud where it's found. Uh, potentially, it could be a bit of a cost to the council. In, in many cases, it's not significant. We have we have pursued frauds, uh, um, and we have um, put money into those investigations, um, even where where you know potentially there's not a lot of money to be made from pursuing that so i think there is a public duty on the authority to pursue fraud and and do everything we can to make sure the public purse is protected uh, and that is certainly my intention and i believe will be members intention that we pursue that going forward thank you chair it, it acts as a deterrent as well as as much as anything else and that's that's why i mentioned about the money because it's you you're never going to actually reliably quantify the, the to deterrent basis um, but it's definitely it's definitely a principled matter I, mean, I, I i'll look towards councillor chamberlain and say as, as you are chair of scrutiny and overview committee have, have you got anything that may be of benefit to, to this audit committee with regards to the, the report that you received on the planning performance No, I think, I think we actually felt uh, that significant improvement had been made um, and we really asked that that should continue and that they would come back to us uh, in another six months with a further update just to let us know how things were going. Um, but uh, the, I think there was a degree of confidence that things had uh, improved quite significantly over the, over the last quarter that we considered. Are there any further questions from the committee? No? I see no further questions. So um, the committee has asked to note the report from internal audit, and I thank Jonathan for his attendance and, and presentation. And we will move on to uh, agenda item nine, which outlines the mid-year treasury management report. May I ask Peter Maddock to present this report? Thank you. So, um, as part of our Treasury management strategy, um, we report to Audit and Governance Committee twice a year in relation to our, the outturn and then the mid-year position. So, this report is looking at the first six months of this financial year. So, there's a number of tables in the report that look at um, what money we've got invested and where, and also um, tables around the amount of borrowing we have uh, and again this is all as at the 30th of September just gone um, there's also attached a, a little bit of commentary from our um, Treasury advisors around the general context within which this is set uh, and the general economic conditions um, so um, I don't know if there's any questions on anything particular in that report um, please do
Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chairman. I think this follows on very much from our conversations at the last audit meeting. And I thank um, officers and Mr Merritt for the report, particularly the section on liquidity. Um, I'm just looking at page 51 on the maturity structure of the borrowing, just noting that, you know, it, uh, substantial figures are repayable on, on a very short-term basis. And this, and this does get raised sort of in, in various points. I'm just wondering, given the changes as well, what position we're at, because we are getting into the latter end of, of the year, what our refinancing plans are, um, given it is multiple millions that we're going to either have to repay back or refinance. My understanding, but I would like clarification, is that we'll be looking to refinance these, these loans. Um, and if we are doing so on a short or long-term basis on what we're looking to do, um, if not repaying. Um, I think there may be supplementaries based on the answer, Chair, but, but I'll leave it there for a moment. Thank you. So, so yes, we have seen some movements in, in, in interest rates. Um, we had a meeting with our Treasury advisors a couple of weeks ago. Um, their advice to us is for the moment that we should still carry on with our current strategy of um, borrowing on a short-term basis. Um, very long-term rates are coming down, but we're talking about 50 years plus. So, so the sort of longer term that we would be looking at, the rates are still significantly higher in shorter term. Um, I think this is something we're going to need to keep under quite a close review uh, over the next sort of year, six months to a year, possibly. Um, but we've got another meeting scheduled with our advisors straight after Christmas to again look at this. Um, but certainly, at the moment, the strategy is that we refinance the loans that we have with short-term borrowing for the moment, possibly up to three years. So, we won't be. We will be looking potentially to, from what you said, to refinance that. So we're not repaying that in that in that loan period. So we're, we've got a strategy where we're going to be looking to keep refinancing. Um, I only, only say that because I, I appreciate and understand with the interest rates how they are, but on that basis, you, there is an element of, of risk, um, substantial risk, potentially. And I'm just wondering how we're, how we're balancing and offsetting that because it's something that, you know, unforeseen things do happen. I mean, and later items and what have you were, ref were referring to the reliance on um, COVID vaccines um, but now we've got a new variant I think actually it does fall in this appendix B chair on page 57 um, so that in itself even though this meeting was in in September it, it was very re it's it references so obviously has taken into consideration the COVID vaccine rollout and the impacts that would have we have a new variant now, um, so when that gets reviewed, that's you know, we all hope that new variant does not have consequence. I should emphasise, but there are so many unknowns in this current climate that surely that increases the risk of of this strategy. And I'm, I'm wondering whether that's something, Chair, that we we should be very mindful of. Um. I think you're right. I mean, you know, there is there is significant risk uh, going forward. Uh, I think that's why we're going to be having sort of probably bi-monthly meetings with our Treasury advisors uh, to keep things under review. Um, our medium-term financial strategies, it currently stands, assume we will, it does assume that we will move to longer-term borrowing in next financial year at the moment. We'll be reviewing that position. My suspicion is that we will move that on another year. But that will be based on advice that we get from our Treasury advisor. So I think you're right, it's something we need to keep under review. Uh, I'm loath to go longer term when the, the, the difference in cost between the two is so significant. Um, but equally, it's so difficult to judge at what time, at time, at what time we amend that strategy. And I think that's very important that we have regular contact with our Treasury advisors because you know, they do 
well, areas close to the ground and they, they have better knowledge on this than us. But to stay at the moment, they're saying sit tight, run the short term, and we'll review it in a couple of months. I, I seem to recall from an, an earlier year that there becomes a, a point in the last fiscal quarter, so January, February, March, where the liquidity and availability is difficult in the, in the marketplace. Do we have any risk of loans expiring in the next quarter that we may face not being able to roll over? So, so what we've been doing is we've been looking ahead and trying to plan ahead when we need to refinance. So my colleague that does this arranges for if it looks like we need to refinance in February, or if it looks like we need new loans in February, for example, we will set those up well in advance so that we have the guarantee that that money will be available at a guaranteed rate. So that's something that we've been doing for, for the, the current borrowing. So um, I'm due to catch up with him later this week to see where we are. Um, and you know we can set loans up, borrowing up for three months hence, Again, the difficulty there is knowing exactly how much you need and when you need it. So it's a bit of a balancing act between um, looking at when you need the money. And our, our cash flow prediction suggests we are going to need to borrow some additional money between now and the end of the year. So um, I need to check when that is, but I believe it's February. And I believe we're going through the process of, of setting up some of those loans at this point so that we know that we get the money and we, know we have certainty on the rate that we're getting at least for the two, three year period of that borrow. Councillor Williams. Could I, can I just, a moment. Um, can I just clarify um, on page 52, paragraph 38, it, it feeds on chair after your question um, about the 90 million of short term loans to be repaid in the second half of, of this financial year which we're now in, it's forecast that 40 million in new short-term loans will be required to externalise our internal borrowing. I take it that the 40 million includes the refinancing of the 19 or is that additional on top? Page, page 52, paragraph 38. Just wondered if the 40 million is inclusive of the 19. Or if that's on top, because I think that might help address chair. The... So, so we're looking at going. To, we're going to need to borrow as a council forty million pounds um, in the next few months, essentially. Yeah, I, I mean, we've been reviewing this position even since the report was written, and I don't think it'll now be as much as that. But what I'll, I'll, let me double check to be absolutely certain that's what we're saying. But I'll, 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 I'm due to speak to our Treasury um, accountant, uh, I think it's uh, Friday. So. Chair, in the report that you circulate, could you provide those figures, please? Yeah, I think if, if, if you can, when you provide the update on the other one, if you can provide an update on what the situation is, so that it's, it's very clear what to roll over, what's new. Um, value that's required to be uh, financed in, in the final quarter. Any, any further questions? I see no, no further questions from the committee. Um, so the committee is asked to note the report and uh, we will move on to agenda item 10 which is the risk management report which outlines the current processes for managing risk for the local authority and proposals to further improve risk management across the council. May I ask Anne Ainsworth to present her report? Thank you very much, Chair, um, and thank you for the opportunity to present this report to you today. So um, what we've presented to committee today is the high level strategic risk, risk register for the council. So these are the risks that are corporate, that are strategic, that would have an impact across the organisation and for our communities. And also that if that risk, if, if that 
action occurred, it would be significant. It would have significant implications if that risk is not managed properly. So these are the risks that, that you have in front of you. There are obviously uh, many other risks for the council, um, risks that sit in particular services or around projects, for example. Um, those risks are less strategic and the impact of those would be less significant if, uh, again, if they were not managed properly. So this is very much that high level strategic risk register that you have in front of you. Um, as mentioned in the report, we have a system called For Risk, and each risk owner is responsible for updating um, their risk and uh, inputting risks and, uh, as I say, keeping them regularly updated as, uh, as a risk may develop. Um, as stated in the report as well, there are a couple of things that we are suggesting that we do over the next few weeks and months to continue to improve how we address risks and how we manage risks across the organisation. And I just wanted to bring these to, to committee's uh, attention. I'd be grateful for any comments on these. So one is around the option to use the system more fully around project risks. Um, currently, the project risks sit within the individual projects and they're managed by the senior responsible officer and the project and the programme manager uh, for those projects. And I feel that we could do more to include those projects within the full risk system and therefore create a better understanding of how some of the interdependencies might work across those corporate risks for the council and then some of those individual project risks as well. We're also recommending that uh, the risk register comes to committee twice a year and I would welcome any uh, suggestions or comments on the way that the current risk register is presented um, or indeed if there are any additional risks or aspects to the risk register that you would like us to bring to you uh, for future meetings. And the final recommendation that I'm, I'm making is around how we ensure that the risks are um, kept at a very, very high level, that, that we have a very high profile around our risks across the organisation. So having them in a range of different meetings where we're talking with them, uh, with, where there's quite a lot of officers and colleagues there. So again, we can look at those interdependencies and we can also make sure that the lessons we've learned in the pandemic, where we've managed risks, I think, incredibly well as an organisation, and we've been very dynamic and we've responded to those risks extremely quickly, making sure that we align that with the way that we use the system, I think, is something that we can continue to improve. My apologies, members. I think I lost you there um, on the system. My apologies. I, I, can I just check? Can everybody hear me again now? Yep, we can hear you. It's fine. My, sorry about that. Um, so that was all, all I wanted to, to present. Chat. Happy to take any questions. All I would say is um, there may be some questions that might be specific to uh, some of the risks or some of the services um, included in the risk register. If that's the case, if we could take those questions away, please, and have a conversation with the risk owners or indeed the head of service and be able to provide a, a written and detailed response and back to committee if there are any questions of that nature. Thank you, Chair, and apologies again for that interruption. Councillor Howell. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I'm just going to say very quickly on one and then a general question, um, if you don't mind, with regards to um, failure to meet targets for building new affordable housing and failing to spend the right to buy receipts. I think that's excellent what's been done there, and I just want to say well done on that one. I won't ask any more. I'm not asking questions. I just it's a topic that um, members know I often speak about, so I'm very pleased to see that. Uh, just a general question, really, um, and I, this is because I've run a couple of risk registers myself in, in, in another capacity. Um, one of the biggest risks we've found um, is a single point of failure. Uh, if I use that as a very specific term, I can see you nodding your head. So can I just ask, have we identified single points of failure within the organisation and are we doing something to address that? And I appreciate sometimes it's very difficult to address that because of the very nature of, of the subject area that they are specialised in. Thank you, Chairman. 
Thank you. Um, yes, if I can answer that question. Um, yes, we, we have identified um, a number of single points of, of failure that there may be across the council or indeed in specific projects. Can I take that away and provide a more detailed response on where we've identified those and the way that we are looking to mitigate and, and address those? I'm more than happy with that, Chairman, yeah, but it's the fact that they've been identified and there's a plan of action is what I was more interested in. But yes, I, I'd be quite happy for that as well. Thank you, Chairman. Councillor Harvey. Yes, um, thank you, Chair. You know, um, I, I was, um, as, as committee would be aware, um, there's been a move in the commercial sector um, on the back of the work being done by the, the task force for uh, climate change related financial disclosure and I, I note the UK government has, has confirmed that large UK registered companies will have to disclose climate related financial data meaning effectively risk uh, from April 2022 um, and, and given that we are quite a large organisation maybe uh, we're not under a statutory organisation uh, a statutory obligation to look at that as a specific task but I wonder whether um, that is somehow coming down the road in some shape or form and we should we should be ahead of the curve on that. Thank you. Thank you. Very happy to, to take that away um, and have and have a look at that in terms of how that's appearing or not appearing at the moment in the risk register and whether that is something that we need to add. Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, just, just a few points on, I think um, I, I would be in agreement with, with the words around the audit of accounts on page 68 and not wishing to rerun any of that. But um, yeah, I think hopefully we'll get to a point where we can change the colour on that and make it down to yellow. Um, but for now, I think it is in its appropriate place. Um, on page 69, I do think that this may already be included, so I'm just seeking some clarification, because it says about careful ongoing monitoring of housing supply by the five-year land supply officer, um, but not just looking at housing supply. Um, do we also look at inspectorate decisions and appeals? And I'm just thinking in particular, we obviously there's the appeal at Sawston, Mill Lane Sawston, where the land supply is being challenged. I'm just wondering whether we, we look at sort of trends in that as well around how inspectors are taking COVID into consideration or, or anything like that. Because obviously it is a, the planning inspector in themselves, as I think the council knows to, to a, a severe cost, is, is a risk un, unto themselves to the council. Um, and just wondering if that's something that we are looking at. Um, I, and I would say on page 70, insufficient people, resources and skills. I'm wondering whether, whether really that should be, should be read. So I'd be interested to know more details about how we've come to that conclusion. Just because um, myself, Councillor Howell, and indeed Councillor Williams, we sit on the staff and the employment committee, so we know about the high dependency we have on, on agency staff and also that we have had service interruptions on on waste collections and things due to insufficient drivers. So um, I'm just wondering, that seem, we, and I'm not saying we're not doing lots of things, but it does seem in that climate and while residents are experiencing that odd that, that the um, risk is quite low. The governance of shared services, I mean, I think that is, that is clearly a risk and I know Scrutiny is doing a, a lot of work on that. Um, I, th I think I think we possibly need to do do more to sort of try and communicate through the council and maybe to this committee as well because um, I know there's been an awful lot of work done by by scrutiny and some members sit on both but some don't and just to understand um, yeah you know, it says the court is shared services member lead meetings and things like that if there's documentation or minutes or something that can help um, councillors make that accessible to them, I think would be very helpful, Chair. I think that's me done. Councillor Sample. Uh, thanks, Chair. Uh, yes, I think in terms of the, how this is presented, um, it, it might be helpful to be able to see the, um, the figures of, 
uh, likelihood and impact that go into creating the the, the, uh, the total um, risk that's been uh, risk rating that's presented in the in the report. Um, the, the other the other thing is I wonder whether there are in terms of learnings from this, what you take away from it, um, just making sure that the uh, broad themes that come out from this aren't missed. So to me, it seems as though process change is a big issue. Now we've talked about that with respect to some of the uh, changes in the processes around the uh, creation of, of accounts. Um, IT is clearly an ongoing one. Um, and I think thinking about how we as a council are able to adapt and manage successfully the changes in process across the board, I think would be a useful, an example of a useful theme to, uh, to reflect on and return to. And then I think my final point is really around, it's just a very specific one, I, I don't want to spend too long on it, but on the audit of accounts, I think in terms of um, the ongoing issues and the uh, risk control mitigations. I think we perhaps ought to think about including uh, something there about the um, the uh, upcoming process for identifying a new auditor through the PSAA and the need for the council to assert itself uh, as far as possible in that contract as to the uh, service that we would expect from the future auditor. Thank you. Are you happy, Chair, for me to respond to those questions? Yes. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the, the first question around the, the risk around inspectorate appeals and decisions, I'd need to go back into the system and have a look whether that is captured uh, anywhere elsewhere. Um, but I'm very, very happy to do that and to provide a response around that. Uh, I think it's, it's an excellent point. And if it isn't uh, captured fully, then we need to have a look uh, at adding that into the, uh, into the risk register. In terms of the point around resources for, um, for, for people, essentially insufficient people, resources and skills, the reason that that's yellow um, is because that final column is about ongoing or actions that we will be taking right now or over the next few weeks and months. And in talking with the, the risk owner, with uh, Jeff Membry, we came to the view that as we continue to um, engage with those actions as we continue to deliver them, then we would be reducing the risk to the level that it's currently recorded in the risk register. I appreciate that um, there will probably always be um, some views and, and some thinking around some of the um, the scoring levels with risk, but we did feel that once those actions have uh, have been put in place that we they would be effective in helping to reduce the risk. Uh, in terms of governance of, of shared services, uh, if committee is happy, I would like to pick that up with the, the lead member for shared services uh, and have that conversation uh, with them. Um, and the figures that go in in terms of how that makes up the risk score, yes, very happy to explain that, provide more detail around that in, in a future report. Uh, same with the broad themes. Uh, thank you. I think that is an excellent suggestion and very happy to, to again, pull those out into a covering report so that it would be uh, more easy for committee members to see where some of those uh, overarching issues were occurring in terms of the strategic risk register. Um, and in terms of audit and, and perhaps adding that risk into the risk register, could I just ask Peter Maddock, um, I'm presuming, Peter, we would be happy with that um, just want to check given that Peter is in the meeting. Yes, of course, that's fine. Thank you. Then, then we will do that. We will make sure that that is added to the strategic risk register. Thank you. Any, any further questions from the committee? Okay, so the committee is asked to note the report and uh, thank the presentation of the report by, by, by Anne. Uh, we move to agenda 11, which is the matters of topical interest. Um, 
It wouldn't be an audit meeting, Chair, if I didn't mention the toolkit. Um, I thank you for sending around what you what you did, and I've I've looked through it. I I genuinely do think, especially with what's gone on, while I know I may get groaned at by some by creating homework for ourselves, I I do think it's equally important that we make sure we equip ourselves in, in the most appropriate way. And so I, I would like to see, I knew we were going to explore costs and things like that, but I really would like to see us take, now we've seen what it can do, to take that forward. Um, and uh, I think that would be something that we can do to, you know, help give assurance to people that we're taking the matter seriously and, and um, every day is a school day. It's, it's a reminder for me to follow up with EY. I, I, I did contact EY and ask them for the information around the toolkit. They provided it. I did, I did ask for a timetable as to when it could be possible for us to attend the toolkit and presentation and get a real thinking around it. Uh, but, but with the audit, I haven't had a response. Um, but I will take this from the following this meeting and, and follow up and see if I can get some sort of timetable together. I appreciate, appreciate the Thank you, Chair. Now, I believe that, that Rory would like that to come in and, and, and raise something as well. Thank you, Chair. Chair, very briefly, I just wanted to let the committee know um, and would ask Patrick to record this in the minutes that there's been no use of RIPA powers um, in the last quarter and since this committee last met. Um, I'm guessing that there aren't going to be any questions as the powers haven't been used, um, but i um, happy to take any if there are. Thanks. That's fine, Rory. There's, there's no, no questions from the committee. Thank, thank you for providing the update. Thank you. Thank you. Right. No further topical interest. Um, then, as we discussed earlier in the meeting, there's a date of the next meeting. Now, the agenda says Tuesday, the 29th of March, but obviously we, we know we want to meet in January. So, given the discussions that occurred with internal and external auditors around deadlines, requirements to meet deadlines and we have a, a proposed drop dead date of the 14th of January. For members, which date would you like to? Chairman, choose? with your permission, can we ask if Patrick could put out a doodle poll and we can sort it out that way? Happy to do it that way. If people haven't got their agenda, agendas to hand. Chair, I'll just say, I think it, it's going to be an important meeting that one. If either will be, you know, in relief that we've it's across the line or, or we're really going to have to have answered serious questions so it is important that that we have um you know good attendance for that meeting i think we should be as close to the 14th as as possible um obviously not before so if we can all of us try and make sure we can get um get in i wouldn't wish to delay it too much um if you're in agreement, Chair. The 14th is, is the Friday. So if, if we request a doodle poll to be sent out for, I would say, to allow a few days for the Wednesday, Thursday, or the Friday, so 19th, 20th, or 21st, and then we can we can see where, where that make, makes the most. I agree with that, Chair. Is that okay? Yeah, okay. So we will send out a doodle poll and then commit to a date when hopefully we will be signed off the accounts or getting a response as to what happened in the past month. I thank everybody for their attendance at, at, at the meeting and uh, I look forward to wishing you a happy Christmas. <laughs> thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>